YouTube family, click the link and subscribe as we look ahead to the best of the weekend action. Vamos! Another weekend, another set of enticing fixtures and lots of goals. Well, that's if we don't have to depend on Barcelona, that is. In the Premier League, there's the Middle Eastern rich boy. My $100 bills don't fit in my wallet. Squabble at the back of Emerald Palace Derby as Man City travels to Newcastle United. Well, we get a good American scrimmage as Jesse Marsh's Leeds United States of America take on Todd Bowley's Chelsea Commanders. Try and better that Ted Lasso season three. There's more calcio in Italy as Atalanta face AC Milan, La Liga and Lille host PSG in France as Galtier faces his former side. This and much, much more. We got the whole crew here as Michael Lahu, James Bench and Jonathan Johnson all jump in. Kigo Lasso weekend preview begins right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Keo Lasso. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. To begin with, 20,000 subscribers on YouTube. We have done it. Thank you so much on behalf of the entire team. Michael LaHood, you showed up first. How are you feeling? 20K. How are you, bud? Uh, I'm champagne drunk right now. Pop and bop now. Just uh, awesome. Can't wait to get into today's show. And Happy I don't have to talk about Manchester United. So I yeah, love it. Leave it I know that. James Bench will want to talk about Manchester United. How are you, James <laughs> Bench? How's it going, buddy? Uh, I am fantastic. I, I think we can now overflow the Vitality Stadium with all of our subscribers. <laughs> um, I don't know who we're coming for. Who are we coming for next? <laughs> I don't know. Well, well, Old Trafford. But, we're coming. I mean, how oh, many people yeah. can actually go in Old Trafford? <laughs> yeah. I, Old Trafford next, because there's no way they're filling that stadium these days. Yeah, you know, just keep, bring it on, boys. Bring it on. <laughs> Jonathan Johnson, how are you, bud? Yeah, doing very well. Thanks. Obviously, delighted. Uh, you know, all the hard work that's gone into the last 18 months or so to get us here. Kudos to you guys and everyone else who's uh, who's joined us uh, since uh, since the beginning. And no, uh, it's fantastic news and looking forward to getting another in the books with you today. Absolutely. Thank you so much, everybody. Seriously, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, 20,000 subscribers on this uh, still very young uh, show means a lot to all of us. So like JJ said, on behalf of the whole team, thank you very much. All right, let's get going. It's our weekend preview, baby. The most exciting of episodes, of course. Let's begin in the Premier League. Well, Lisa Roman, uh, if you could put the fixtures up, uh, we have some very good fixtures. So today, I think what we'll do, everybody, is the boys will pick a game or a storyline that they want to focus on, and we'll get into it. Uh, a word of note, we're not really talking Liverpool-Manchester United that much today. That will be part of our Sunday recap as it's the Monday game. But you can see the fixtures here on Saturday. Tottenham Wolves, Everton, Nottingham Forest, Leicester, Southampton, Fulham, Brentford, Palace, Aston Villa, Bournemouth, Arsenal. And, of course, there's Sunday games as well, which include Newcastle, Man City, and I believe uh, some other games West Ham as well playing. So, you know, we can pick a, a storyline here from the Premier League. Where do you want to go? Michael LaHood, you go first, buddy. Where do you want to go? Uh, I start with the, the top of the hour. Tottenham Hotspurs versus Wolverhampton Wanderers for Tottenham. Not the best performance by them this past weekend against Chelsea, a game which I thought they were thoroughly outplayed for mo most of it. Didn't have their first corner kick till about, what, 65th, 70th minute. But the resilience and the resolve that they had to get a draw when they weren't playing well, I think that's something that's going to bode well for them is Premier League champions are teams that compete at the top of the Premier Leagues. You have to earn points when you're not playing well. The Uniteds, the Arsenals, the Chelsea's, the Cities, they find ways to win, and Liverpool's got to put them in there as well. So Spurs showing a bit of metal. Now in this game, Antonio Conte has yet to start any of his new summer arrivals. In that Chelsea game, his summer arrivals came in to change the game. Richarlson wins the free kick that sets up the corner kick. Ivan Perisic takes the corner kick, I think, that sets up the Harry Kane goal. Harry Kane doing what he does, doing what he does well, getting a much needed goal. And for Wolves, they can't they can't buy a goal. Raul Jimenez still out injured, heard he was training and back to training, but still quite a, a few weeks away, maybe a month away to get back in. They create chances, but not scoring goals could be their undoing this season. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree, but I, what I'm intrigued by is, is how easy Tottenham will will find it to score goals. Like mm. Bruno Large's team, they're, they're trying to be a bit more expansive. Obviously, they've moved away from the back three, but I'm certain when they rock up to uh, the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium on Saturday morning, they're going there with the aim of keeping a clean sheet and, like you said, trying to nick one at the other end. But, you know, what we haven't kind of seen from Tottenham so far is is whether they can break down that sort of slightly robust I mean, obviously, you know, it's two games in. We haven't seen yeah. a lot about of every team 
But you know, when we talk about the summer signings that haven't arrived, that haven't played, well, actually, the one that hasn't arrived is the, the maybe the creative midfielder that's mm. going to be needed to to pick the lock, to to find a way through really solid defenses. I don't know if Wolves is that. I know that they can be that, and they were last season. And that for me is the missing piece. Obviously, you know, they may well be doing this without Antonio Conte on the bench as well. Like, one of my highlights of the not just of the season so far, like the decade, was that set two between Antonio Conte and Thomas Tuchel. How good He's... was that, by the way? Like, so can we see that? Is... I need to have that every weekend, just like this. Like, and they loved it. And in the press conference, they were kind of laughing about it. And then Conte on Instagram or Twitter, whatever. We need this kind of Antonio Conte energy. And Thomas Tuchel, to his point, right, James? Man? I think. Well, I mean, how good was it? I really didn't enjoy the press conferences because it was a bit like you know that inter- the famous interview, uh, the Sex Pistols gave on BBC TV in the <laughs> late 1970s where the interviewer was just going go on say something outrageous you know say something and that's what we were basically doing to all, you know the other journalists I couldn't Great get a word use in. of sex pistols James <laughs> we're doing we're doing to Conte and you couldn't get them to keep it going and we were like come on give us some beef yeah. Uh, squash some beef but <laughs> sadly the beef had been pre-squashed beforehand yeah, um, <laughs> and I think in the end it will you know we're waiting to find out as we talk now it's a couple of hours they have left to respond to the charges we're waiting to find out whether Tuchel and Conte will be banned from the touchline I, I'm not sure whether they will be the possibility they won't um, like it will certainly be tougher without Conte because I think his his fighting spirit translate it to Tottenham on the pitch and uh, mm-hmm. if they have to grind a team down if they have to show that will to win it's always good to look across the bench and be terrified that Antonio Conte is going to rip your throat out if you're not working hard enough yeah I think we're all disappointed that Conte hasn't already issued his response via Instagram I think I, I, I don't know if my favorite part was uh the set two as James mentioned on the pitch or what followed afterwards that it'll dig on uh, on social media I thought that was great <laughs> Happy to see Conte delivering uh, this early in the season. Fingers crossed it can continue. I think Spurs are not necessarily going to be a slow burner, but I think they're going to grow into the season a bit. But the thing that makes me curious about not necessarily this match, but the the remainder of the season going forward is Wolves, because a couple of weeks ago, James and I were part of the, well, James, Mike and I were part of the the Premier League preview and Wolves were thrown out by Mr. James Ben (laughs) as potential relegation (laughs) candidates. And since they heard that, they've gone and spent nearly a hundred million euros on talent you've got the likes of Mateus Nunez coming in uh who you know Pep Guardiola you know can't stop raving about you've got yeah I, as well. I mean I want to go back to Nunez for a second because this is not just a good acquisition JJ this is a very good player right and uh, and by the way I think that Wolves now have 11 Portuguese players I think <laughs> I think that now everybody in Wolverhampton gets a free Nando's at this point, just because there's so many Portuguese. But JJ, Nunes is a really, really good purchase. I mean, how highly do you rate him? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's a player who people have been talking about for a while. I mean, obviously for me, uh, covering uh, covering football in France, there's a lot of players who move from Portugal to France and then move on to a league like the Premier League. And this guy has been mentioned, linked with a number of clubs, but was obviously such a special talent that, you know, he could make the jump uh, immediately. We've seen some guys like Bernardo Silva come to Ligue 1 first, then go to the Premier League. But when you've got people like, uh, you know, Guardiola singing your praises, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be very difficult for clubs in a league like Ligue 1 to, to rival a Premier League club. And I just think the, the most surprising thing is perhaps the, the the destination. You know, many people sort of wondered if, uh, you know, Wolves sort of Portuguese dalliance was starting to fade a little bit. And now suddenly they've gone out and, and got not just one, but two, because Gedge as well coming in from uh, coming in from Valencia. So, you know, two very interesting moves, in my opinion. And I assume that the, the move for the latter, uh, you know, they're going to be hoping that he can bring some goal scoring form. I didn't get to see that much of uh, of that in when he was in Paris, but uh, you know, obviously he's been one of the the more key players over the last couple of years for Valencia. So suddenly Wolves, uh, you know, they they have this new look about them. Whether or not we'll see much of that against Spurs this weekend, we'll have to wait and see. But I am curious to see how it plays out over the remainder of the season. Well, let me tee up the predictions then for this game that Michael Lahoud is focusing on Tottenham against Wolves. I'm with James Bench. I know there's a lot of purchasing involved, but Wolves still worry me a little bit just because it's a little bit of a conservative strategy and Tottenham, I think, at home might take care of business. I'm going with a 2-1 win for Tottenham, Michael Lahoud. What do you say? I'm going 2-0. 
I like the two goals, but look, Wolves, they created almost 22 chances or 20, had 22 shots. But in the last game against Fulham, it wasn't for a lack of chance creation that bothered him. It was a lack of ex- execution in the final third. I think between Huang, Neto and Podence, they're not really pr- like the type of players that you depend upon and responsible goal scorers. I think that they still need a little bit of work in the final third. And I just don't see it this game. One nil Spurs. Nice and easy. We're all going with a Tottenham win. JJ? You know, you guys have taken all the good predictions. So I'm going to be forced to go 3 1, which is kind of like a mix <laughs> of all, all of the different <laughs> possibilities. And, on Spurs. Wolves, and Wolves will win this, I bet you, anybody. All right, let's uh, let's move on. Let's, uh, let's go to uh, James Bench. Uh, what's your match of choice over the weekend, buddy? Yeah, well, I know everyone's going to want to see lots and lots of goals and lots of mistakes. That's what we watch the Premier League for. We don't watch it for tactical excellence. We watch it for banter. And therefore, I've picked the two worst defences in the Premier League. That is Nottingham Forest, at least in terms of expected goals, I have to say. But, you know, Mm. early in the season, that is Nottingham Forest, who've given up four. And uh, four exactly, and Ast- uh, Everton, who've given up 3.96. You were so... about to say Aston Villa there. The Freudian <laughs> slip, James. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but obviously, looping back to Wolves, um, th- one of the more impressive aspects of that Mateus Nunes deal is that they've effectively funded it by selling a player who, who Bruno Large didn't want in uh, Morgan Gibbs-White, who I think is now the 16th signing Nottingham Forest will make. As, as we're recording now um, around 3 p.m. UK time on Thursday, the deal has just about, just been agreed as we speak. I'm told it's 25 million up front, somewhere between 7 and 10 million in achievable add-ons, but it could ultimately, if Gibbs-White proves to be a huge success, be 42 and a half million pounds which is almost exactly Guys, are we are we sure that newcastle are the new money in the <laughs> this is just ridiculous yeah is, i mean and bear in mind that a lot of the the business forest have done is it around the sort of 10 million pound mark so this is a huge investment now i would kind of look at it and say actually 25 million for a player who's had a good season in the championship is maybe not that out of whack anymore you know how much if you know how much might Mitrovic have gone for if mm. Fulham had had to cash in, but I think once you start escalating it up, it is, it is massive. And I mean, I kind of, you know, I I hadn't didn't see a huge amount of Sheffield United last season, but I did kind of wonder where does he fit into Steve Cooper's team? Lewis I mean, O'Brien was amazing. It's the weekend. same Fulham question, right, James Bench? Because I, I want to stick on this in this issue right now for a second. Nottingham mm. Forest, we're all very happy to see them back in the Premier League. It was great to see them. City ground looks amazing. Steve Cooper yelling to the camera saying it's not over yet. Like everybody was just celebrating. But I'm I'm on transfer market right now as you're talking. And it's kind of it's like it's two pages. It's two pages of arrivals. And granted, they got rid of a few because they've had to restructure, but where are you leading, James Benjamin? and everybody else chime in? Like, is it more of a Fulham thing and even a villa, dare I say, from, from before? Or do you see this working out? Because it's a lot of new players coming into the Premier League. Yeah, I, d- I don't quite see it working out. I mean, we have to say they did lose about 12 players, some yeah. of whom were more willing than others. So they, they needed to bulk up the squad. But I think, you know, the, they obviously a wonderful win against West Ham. But they looked so vulnerable without the ball because that, I think, is where the challenge is, is can you drill shape and structure into these players that don't really know each other in a manner of weeks? I, I think kind of the attack will come quicker. But, I mean, it is it is a question of whether they can, they can hold firm at the back. So, yeah, they needed to strengthen. And, I mean, clearly having and, and add bodies and having better bodies is better than none at all. But I do, yeah. I mean, they, they're coming up with very little like coherence and chemistry. And I think that that's going to cost them. But three points at Goodison Park against a pretty underwhelming uh, Everton team that don't really have a striker. All they need to do is score one, probably. And, um, you know, six points, you're what? Six, one sixth of the way there already. It's not too bad, suddenly. <laughs> I mean, I think, I mean, imagine the carnage if if Forrest don't manage to stay up and go down and then you've mm. suddenly got to move those players on. But I guess there's different ways of looking at it because the gulf now between the Premier League and the Championship is becoming such that you almost need a new squad in order to give yourself the best shot of survival possible. I mean, we saw it, LME and I, uh, as Villa fans, uh, you know, when Villa came back up to the Premier League, you know, you almost have to restructure that squad entirely. And, you know, surviving by the skin of your teeth 
in your you know first season back after a long time away is perhaps uh, you know better than uh, you know sort of not really you know giving it a, a you know giving a good account of yourselves uh, and dropping back down and then becoming this yo-yo side and perhaps that's what Forest are going to try to to rail against you'd expect that with uh, the investment that they've made but it is a huge risk uh, you know and, and like James rightly said there's so many questions about whether you can generate enough uh, you know chemistry to you know for, for the players to to gel and pick up the results necessary to stay up over the course of the season but this kind of game I mean it's very very early in the season to call it a six pointer but you'd expect that Everton will spend the majority of the campaign toiling at the wrong end of the table you know Forest need to be targeting this as potentially three points especially while Everton have so many questions uh you know hanging over their team in different areas of the pitch in Dean Henderson, we trust. That is going to be over the new Nottingham Forest. You're all your hopes on Dean Henderson. You're all your hopes on the goalkeeper, Mike We trust, baby. (laughs) If you're a Nottingham Forest fan, that is what you're going to bed saying each week from now on for the rest of your Premier League lives because this guy is going to have to play out of his mind like he did this past weekend. I love that you said, JJ. I I think, Benji said the same thing. Worse, Mike, because they could have David De Gea in. Going. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, hey, I know, I know, you're trying to get me to talk about United. I took my meds. I'm not going to talk about them. I see what you did there. <laughs> Mike, they're coming all, all show. They're coming. Keep going. No, no, buddy. no. But uh, I think they've what they've done so well in the transfer market is getting Awani. I think this guy is a player who could step into most teams outside of the top six and be a starter. And it wasn't just that he bundled in his just an opportunistic finish of being in the right place at the right time. It's his movement in the final third that makes him a handful. And when you, you have to have a guy, if you're going to come up from the championship, you have to have someone who can score goals to keep you up in the prem. Ties won't do it. Losses certainly won't do it. And Jesse Lingard, hey, keep scuffing shots, baby. You'll be a Nottingham Forest hero. Get your name under the badge like Dean Henderson. Yeah, well, my player to watch is Brennan Johnson. I think he's the one that's really uh, got to light it up. But I tell you what, city ground, I think, is going to be the most important factor in Nottingham Forest season. And we all know that a newly promoted side needs needs to do well at home. So as long as they can keep doing that, who knows? Okay, we're going to do predictions, but we've talked a lot about Nottingham Forest. We haven't talked enough about Everton, a side who I still think are going down. I just I don't see where it can work out. But they're at home to a newly promoted side. They did play well in the opening game, of course, uh, against Chelsea and, of course, now. And then they lost to Villa in the last weekend. So they do really need something here. Give me your predictions, James Bench, uh, and including, if you want, your thoughts on Everton. Because Frank Lampard does have a little bit of a job to do. Although, Onana, what's my uh name? Onana. Oh, my God. (laughs) This kid looks ridiculous. I mean, Uh ridiculous. Does he, or is he just an actual competent midfielder wearing an empty shirt? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. No, he looks the business. He looked, he? Yeah, he, yeah, was, yeah, he was yeah. amazing coming off the yeah. bench. I He's really liked him. Yeah. But they yeah. need more players like him. You know, they need younger bodies. I, I'm, I'm still baffled kind of week in, week out that there's no new striker arrived. I'm assuming that, you know, it's going to be Anthony Gordon or, or Solomon Rondon mm. playing up front again. And, and that's the issue is if you're entirely reliant on Dominic Calvert-Lewin's fitness, you could be in a really sticky position. I think for that reason, um, uh, I'm, I'm shading towards Forrest and I'm going to give Forrest a 2-1 win here. Mm. Wow. 0-3 oh, for Everton from James Bench. JJ? You know what? That was exactly the score I was going to pick. So I'll go 1-0 no, Forrest. I'm not that confident in them keeping a clean sheet, but you know why not? Go crazy. It's Goodison Park after Oh, you're unbelievable. Nobody's given Everton a win right now. Mike LaHood. I'm going to stick with the Everton L train. I'm going to go 1-0. And I think Onana is going to give a handful of problems coming out of midfield. But this is an Everton team that just looks devoid of confidence. Against Villa, they really up the tempo. But they, they're a team that needs to go down to come alive. And you can't, you can't survive like that in the Premier League. And I think just that win last week for Nottingham Forest is going to keep them just on a high. And Dean Hendo, build the statue, put it on the badge. <laughs> Hendo again with another big game. What's your result? What was it? Oh, 1-0. 1-0 to Forest. Okay, so everybody's going with Forest. All right, I'm going with a draw. I, I, it's going to be a scrappy, mm. scrappy game. And I feel like Everton will get one in like the 70th minute. They'll be celebrating. And out of nowhere, 
Brendan Johnson will set somebody up and it'll be one on that'll be it. But I definitely don't see a win for Everton. All right, let's keep moving here. JJ, I don't even need to uh, ask you uh, where you're going uh, for your weekend. Yeah, obviously, you'd be surprised if I wasn't going to Selhurst Park. No, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I really don't know how to feel about this game. I'm really confused because, <laughs> like, the preseason optimism is kind Palace of against off, Villa, especially... everybody, just in case, by the way. Just it's, especially, with the, especially with the injury to Diego Carlos. And mm. really now I'm curious to see what Gerard does in the absence uh, of Carlos. You know, does he decide to move Kamara back into the defence, despite the way that Kamara has started in midfield? Uh, it's you know it's going to be a real poser and Palace is never an easy place to go especially not team, in that sort of solid they're form that they're looking yeah. to be in at the beginning mm -hmm. of this season so yeah. I think this one could be a tricky one for Villa unfortunately but I also think it's a good time to have uh, you know that test in depth because if if Villa do feel uh, you know that they aren't adequately equipped uh, at this moment in time they have a little bit of time left to move in the transfer window I'm not convinced that going for a defender is necessarily what Villa should be looking to do I think that you know you can probably uh, you know cope with Carlos's loss for a bit and look more intently towards the midfield, which was more of a pressing priority uh, you know for, uh, since the season started anyway. So for me, uh, you know this is going to be a big test for Gerard, and you know he did manage to to lead us to a victory at Selhurst Park in I think what was either his first game or one of his first games uh, last season. So you never know. Fingers crossed. I mean, Fingers I'm crossed. really intrigued how Villa go about defending actually from the front rather than the back mm. i mean mm. like you say jj losing diego carlos is a big loss not least because you know this is a strong physical mobile center back who is just what you need when you look at kind of how palace look to beat players and uh, beat teams and i think we have to remember they played two ball dominant teams that have come expecting to win but we've seen with with joachim anderson like this is a player that can turn attack into defense in mm. one pass if you don't and frustrate hard. Uruguayans on, on the oh, way there God. as well. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, <laughs> thank God that Danny Ings and uh, Ollie Watkins are, are relatively cool heads up. up yeah, there. Danny <laughs> Ings, I'm not worried about that at all. In fact, he'll give it more some. Ollie Watkins, maybe, but... That but, yeah, you might need, but you might need Watkins, because if you're not mm. pressing... No, I think you'll start. Yeah. ...closing down yeah. at, the, at the tip of attack, then Anderson's going to have so much time to yeah. ping these balls into the channels. Zaha looks in great form. Yeah. Um, they, they you know, they've good, got man. so many players like him as well. Eze, or he's coming into his own, I think, mm. as something of a sort of replacement for Conor Gallagher. It's going to take a while for them to find a, like another Conor Gallagher. I'm not sure there's many players like that that exist in the world. Um, like, But this Palace team look like they know what they're doing. Got some great ideas. Cheek to Kure as well. I mean, that's... You yeah. know, it's great for, for JJ in particular, great little league and battle here between <laughs> Bubakar Kamara on one side and, and Dukure on the other. I think this is going to be a really, really fun game. Exactly. But if they'd listened to my calls, you'd have had both of them lining up together. <laughs> 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 no, for, for Aston Villa, someone talked about Ollie Watkins. You have to start him. And, and LME, another player that they combined on the second goal. I think this is a, a Steven Gerrard team where Steven Gerrard has to just figure out his most potent lineup that can compete, can compete, excuse me, I've got Jolly Ranchers in my mouth this morning, compete against the top 10 teams. I feel like there's still uncertainty and there's still a lot of faith being given to Philippe Coutinho, who at what point do you start he or Buendia or both? Ali Watkins, Danny Ings or both? There's just still a lot of question marks about this Villa DNA. And as we talked about with Nottingham Forest, that win last week was not easy. They left it late, they made it nervy, and they were very fortunate to maintain that three points at home. Against a Palace team, if you give up some of those chances, I'm thinking about Tyrone Mings, who, hey, he put his the weight of his worth in gold on that block on Solomon Rondon. Do you start him? Do you keep him in? What are you going to do with that? A lot of questions, but if you give up chances as you gave up against Everton, you will get pepper smacked at Selhurst Park. Yeah, there's no doubt that this is uh, the toughest game yet. Obviously, it's early in the season. Crystal Palace look great. They look great in that draw against Liverpool. They looked even good in the opener against Arsenal because Arsenal are a very good team this season, I feel. And, you know, all the players that we're talking about, I think Aze is going to have a great season. Uh, we know what Saha can do. But now, Vieira has them playing like a unit, and that's mm. scary. And Gerard, to everybody's point, he doesn't know his first 11 yet. He's trying to figure it out. But 
we do look better. We, look, I mean, it wasn't difficult to look better against Bournemouth, but we do look much better against Everton. Look, the Diego Carlos injury is devastating, man. This man has been injured only eight days in his entire career. He comes to Villa. It's the Villa curse, JJ. It's the Villa curse. But I think that as long as we look good off the ball, which begins, to James Benj's point, with Ollie Watkins, he has to start because defending begins with him. He presses so well off the ball. And Buba Kamara, as long as he is solidified in the middle, but I just want to make sure that we don't do anything silly because that goal that Everton uh, scored, you know, courtesy of Lucas Dean, who remains Everton's top goal scorer, um, is due to a mistake from Villa's perspective. But this is a very good Palace side. Straight away, I'm being optimistic and I'm hoping for a draw, but I wouldn't be surprised if we lose. But I'm hoping that we get that point. What do you think, uh, Jonathan Johnson? And then we go around. Yeah, I'm going to say 1-1 like you. I'm hopeful, but I also think that Villa will rise to rise to the test. Uh, like I said, I'm very curious to see how Gerard plays around with the 11. I wouldn't be against dropping Coutinho. I think Mings has definitely earned the right to start. And I think Mings paired with Kamara is something that I would definitely like to yeah, see. No, so Mings needs to start it. straight. Ming, Mings needs to start. <laughs> Mings need like he 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 shot everybody's mouths last game. He was fantastic. Block aside, he was excellent. And we're terrible on, on set pieces, Jonathan Johnson. Mm. He's the only surviving grace for us when it comes off the ball as well. He needs to start. I think Callum Juan Roman Riquelme Chambers needs to start as well. I think he needs to like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean you know it, it's nice oh, to have get a, through a this. <laughs> Villa out of here. No, oh, no, right. we're moving. We're moving. Per, what do you have, per, What do you have? Pers personally, I prefer Cal Dyer, but uh, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go. What? I'm gonna go one one. One zero. What do you have, Bench? <laughs> yeah, three one. Palace. I knew he was. Mm. <laughs> That's a, there's some there's some spite in that prediction. Nah, there. No, he, he I want to talk Leeds Chelsea. We're yeah. going to Mike. What do you have? I go two one. Palace, I think Palace is going to be buoyed by that uh, result, nearly result against Liverpool. And hey, they're great at Selhurst Park. Yep, should be a good game, like Bench said. All right, let's move on. And yes, James Bench, uh, there's two games <laughs> that I want to quickly talk about uh, very quickly. Obviously, the Rich Boy Derby with Man City against Newcastle. We don't have to mention it. The big one, really, I think, is Leeds United against Chelsea. Mm. Uh, definitely for American fan bases, Jesse Marsh's Leeds United States of America, Tyler Adams, Brandon Harrison, <laughs> etc. against Todd Bowley's Chelsea, and we'll see if even Pulisic makes a feature. But this is a, a good test for everybody involved, I think. For Jesse Marsh, of course, and his dynamism when it comes to Leeds uh, and playing as well. And I think they're at home, right, against uh, a Chelsea side that, you know, we'll have to wait and see how they do away from home. James Bench, you wanted to jump on this game. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, like like, like you kind of laid out most of the narrative there, LME, but it, it's kind of spoiled. And right in my preview, I was like, this is very annoying because we aren't going to get this, this battle of American talent on both ends of the pitch, at the very least, obviously. <laughs> mm. You know, American owners and uh, Leeds have that American stakeholders as well from from San Francisco. But uh, I mean, we probably won't see Christian Pulisic in, in any meaningful way. If we do, it will kind of be like he he got against Spurs last weekend, where he's just sort of chucked on. And you know, as we talk now, Manchester United are, are looking to bring him in on loan, and it's not clear whether Chelsea will will agree to that. But he is free to go if he wants. I, I think it's a real shame because. You know, we have kind of missed out on this opportunity to have a a proper, you know, US on US battle on the pitch. But I mean, really excited for what Brendan Aronson and uh, Tyler Adams can do. I think the difference between these two sets of Americans is Adams, Aronson, Aronson brought in to play a role the whole club wanted them. We should say this wasn't just Jesse Marsh deciding to pick them up a, when he took over. Um, whereas... Pulisic, you know, ever since Werner and Havertz arrived, he's had to change his role, became something of a sort of penalty box poacher. And understandably, Chelsea thought, well, we can upgrade on that and get Raheem Sterling to do the same things. Um, it's a shame to be robbed of that story. But also, I mean, we do just have Leeds and Chelsea, one of the great rivalries of, of the 1970s to play out. But uh, a shame to miss some of that US flair to it. Well, U.S. men's national team fans will be just teeming with excitement when this game kicks off, and rightfully so, because this game has World Club implications for the likes of a Christian Pulisic, Tyler Adams, and Brendan Aronson. Let's focus on Pulisic first. This is a game I think will be the definer of whether he stays or just says, you know what, I'll go anywhere. Yeah, can married. I ask you something there uh, quickly, Mike? Like, yeah. I, I, just as a non-American, but somebody that obviously has a you know uh, a huge sentimental. Point for this. I live there. My wife's American, obviously. But 
Pulisic's just not good enough to start for Chelsea. Can we agree to mm. that? Or is it because obviously it's difficult. Obviously, when we talk about a Peruvian player, I get very, you know, biased about it. Is it the same thing from a USMNT perspective? Can we agree that he's just not good enough? Right, Kai Havertz, Raheem, so he's just not good enough. Does it bet? Does it suit him better to just go somewhere else when he can get minutes? I don't even know if he's good enough for United at this point. I'm not. I'm not trying to knock on him. He's he's excellent. He's Captain America, etc. But I think sometimes we need to just realize. Look, Tuchel has a way to play. We're, we're just wading not good into enough. murky waters here. Guys. <laughs> yeah. Here we go again. Here we go. I literally, again. you know, you know Last that meme on the show. Before what, what's that together. meme when you're like that meme of that guy sleeping and a guns on his head? That's gonna happen to me when I get back to the US. So, Mike, but you invested yeah. USMNT fan, what do you think? I think he needs to leave. It, it, whether you're good enough or not as a player, if you have a World Cup on the horizon, you, you got to get minutes first and foremost. You don't want to go into a World Cup. He is solely focused. Forget Chelsea. Chelsea is second in his priority list. He is focused on the U.S. men's national team. That is what's been giving him minutes in the last year and a half and meaningful minutes under during the pandemic season in 2020. He was one. He was one of the reasons why Chelsea did so well. But he really hasn't discovered that form and gotten those opportunities under Thomas Tuchel. And when you play against other national team teammates, there's a bit of envy that happens when you watch your teammates getting productive minutes and, and really being the faces of a Leeds United team. That look, Rodrigo. Let's talk about him with Leeds United. But mm. after this, but there's a bit of envy that comes up as a player that you look at. What happens in this game? You call your agent and said, get me out of here. I'll even go play in Sierra Leone. Hey, we'll take you. <laughs> Sierra Leone Premier League, baby. You can get minutes there. But to finish off with, with Leeds, Rodrigo, he's a player that just looks rejuvenated. He looks more like the Rodrigo that came from Valencia, the Rodrigo that made a splash on the Spanish national team. And his, his movement, whether playing wide or central, he's going to have to have the game of his life for a Leeds team going up against a Chelsea team that looked scary good against Tottenham Hotspurs. Yeah, I mean, for me as well, I'm curious to see what happens with Leeds after they threw away that two-goal lead against Southampton mm -hmm. so late last week, if that impacts them mentally. Because when I mean, you're looking at it on paper, it's been quite a solid start to the season. A bit slow, I guess, from a Chelsea point of view, given they'd have probably expected six points from six. But, uh, you know, I think that they will pick up. And I... I I think that Chelsea will shade it here. Uh, I agree. I think that with you guys, I think Pulisic has to, uh, you know, push for a move between now and the end of the transfer window. And if it's not somewhere else in the Premier League, maybe go back to what he's familiar with. Perhaps, you know, see if there's a, a landing yeah. spot for him in the Bundesliga, because I, I really do think that for him, uh, you know, it really potentially jeopardizes his World Cup chances if he can't get a move. And it doesn't sound like, uh, you know, Chelsea will sort of grant him that move to Manchester United, despite the fact that considering them direct rivals at this moment in time is perhaps at the uh, at the limit uh, of that reasoning. I mean, the one thing, I, the one factual final thing I'd say on, on Pulisic is it, there is an argument to be made that he is, I mean, he's probably still first reserve you know, in the squad right now. And maybe he'll be second if Chelsea get the striker they need. But, you know, there will be minutes available to him across multiple competitions playing at a very high level. Mm. And, you know, I completely agree with what LME said, that he probably isn't getting into even the Manchester United starting 11 week in, week out. So why not maybe be the squad player at the best team you can be a squad player at? You know, the, he needs to get fit. And I mean, that's the challenge is you either go somewhere quite a bit lower down. And I would say maybe even lower than a Newcastle who would play Sam Maximan on the left wing ahead of him. He needs to go quite a way down to be a guaranteed week in, week out starter. Maybe he should actually just stick around rather than and, and get those Champions League minutes, get reps in, in the big competitions. As for the game itself, uh, I think this is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm going 2-2. Two. Mm. Oh, it's going to be wow. a good one. JJ, predictions, quick. Yeah, I'm going to go 2 1 Chelsea. 2 1 Chelsea. And by the way, uh, as much uh, heat as I'm giving Pulisic, Brendan Aronson's my favorite <laughs> American player. He's yeah. ridiculous. Uh, Mike, what do you have as your prediction? I'm going to go 3 1 Chelsea. I predict Brendan Aronson has a part to play in the Leeds goal. Mm. And because Christian Pulisic, he's got that, that, that edge to him when you doubt him. He produces Christian Pulisic's Pulisic goal off the bench. Wow, that, that would be great. Yeah, I'm going for a draw as well, actually. I think I was going to go to, or hopefully it'll be a fun game. Very, very quickly before we take a break, Newcastle against Man City. I actually see Newcastle winning this. Mm -hmm. Does anybody... 
Go with me? No, Bench thinks no. I'm insane. Yeah, Bench, not at all. <laughs> I, I think no. I, I. Yeah, I. I don't know Newcastle, why. I don't know why. Man City the same. best team in the world. I know, but you know, sometimes these teams have like their off days. I feel like this could be it pretty early on. I feel like this is it. St James's Park, all ready to go. Don't you think? Maybe it's just because I want my fantasy. What happened the last time they went to St James's Park? Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah they, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they got killed. All right. Well, what's your prediction for that one? Very quick. Three 0 Three 0 to City. JJ. Yeah, it's interesting. I'm I'm actually going to go two mm. two uh, on this one. Yeah. I think it's okay. going to be. So you're kind of with game. me. You're kind of with me, JJ. You feel like they'll give him a, a little, they'll give him a fight. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, this will be the end of City's winning run, but uh, mm. you know, the season is only two Arsenal games top, long. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, I, mean, I, th I thought that I thought that would play into James's prediction, actually. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we are. Listen, we can all agree Arsenal are fantastic these days. Mm. Mike Lahoud, what do you have on that Newcastle City? Ooh, I'm I'm gonna go. There's a lot of two ones in my uh, crystal ball. I'm gonna go two one. I, I think Newcastle get the first goal, and I just think the quality of City overwhelms them. But St James's Park will be rocking for this match, and they're gonna be the reason why it's a tough game. Should be a good one indeed. All right, we're gonna take a break, everybody. When we come back, we'll quickly touch on some Serie A stuff, some La Liga, of course. Uh, and some uh, JJ will give us the load on and a pretty good game uh, in Liga, by the way, as Christophe Galtier visits his former side. Some final thoughts, and that will be it from our weekend preview. James Bench, Michael LaHood, Jonathan Johnson, LME will be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back to our weekend preview. By the way, Serie A, let's get into it, which you can watch exclusively on Paramount Plus and CBS Sports. The team over there have been doing a fantastic job in this opener, and there's been some enticing stuff. Lisa Run, let's throw up those fixtures. Let's just pick a storyline and then move on super fast. The only thing I wanted to mention was Juventus got going really well, but they have another Monday night game away at Sampdoria, AC Milan, Atalanta, so it should be a good one for Sunday. Uh, Inter Spezia, they had a tough going in opening weekend. So, boys, pick one game, pick one storyline, and uh, we'll get to it. Jonathan Johnson, let's begin with you. Where do you want to go? Well, the obvious temptation for me is to go with uh, Roma against Cremonese because Cremonese sounds like my new favorite pasta dish. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, I mean, uh, th there's a lot to like uh, about, uh, you know, the, the lineup of games this weekend. Uh, and I mean, I think if I had to choose one team, uh, I'd probably look at Napoli because I, I said, mm -hmm. uh, I commented uh, after their opening win that they surprised me with how quickly uh, they hit the ground running. I mean, they've, they've overhauled the squad a lot. Uh, and I think that there is a lot to like about the changes that have been made. There's still some pieces left to add. Uh, you know, they're expected to add Kaelon Navas. Uh, they've got Endon Bele rocking up there. So for me, I think that Napoli have changed my mind quite early on that, because I thought they might drop off and maybe fall out of Champions League qualification reckoning completely. But suddenly I'm looking at this group of players and I'm thinking, you know what, actually they could, uh, you know, finish in that top four and, uh, and get a Champions Champions League spot. So for me, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that one. And Monza, obviously, with all of the, the a little bit like the Italian Nottingham Forest, like within reason, obviously not spending figures that big, but, you know, being quite ambitious with the players they've been targeting to stay up. So I'm curious to see how this one plays out. I think Napoli will win it, but uh, it'll be a good indication of, uh, you know, whether we can see Monza perhaps taking some points off of some of the bigger boys later on in the season. I mean, I'm going to take the the obvious one, Atalanta against AC Milan. I mean, I know that kind of maybe Atalanta have have dropped back a little bit and obviously losing Remo Froiler to the aforementioned Forest, who seem to be coming up much too often on this podcast. That's a bit of a blow. Um, and I think maybe, you know, whereas in a couple of years ago, we'd be putting them in that category with Napoli, as, as JJ's just mentioned, that they're, they're maybe now a step back. Having said that, you know, winning against Sampdoria away from home, I think it was on the opening weekend. I really love that Adamola Lookman pickup for them. I think he's a player that actually his skill sets well suited to Serie A. And then, you know, for this weekend, Demiral and, and Zappa Costa look like being available. So it's a solid defence, a good way to test out this Milan side that that I predicted to win the, the Scudetto. And I'm still pretty confident on that because they managed to rest quite a few players in the opening week. So, yeah, it's the obvious one, but uh, sometimes it's, it pays to, to make the obvious choice. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go least, or less obvious, not least, because uh, I would pick Monza over everything. Monza, Monza, Monza. But I'm going to go Lazio, Torino. This was a matchup last season where uh, Torino, at, when they play a, a top six team other than Juventus, they give them a tough time. And they gave this Lazio team a tough time twice last season, taking points off of them. And 
really making it an interesting running run in for them to get that final spot just outside the Champions League place. And this is a Lazio team that it's do or die, I think, for Mauricio Sarri's men and Mauricio Sarri in particular. But as long as you have Chiro Mobile, good things happen in the final third. Mobile getting that gritty game-winning goal with the Lazio team that had to fight till the end. Hopefully they don't leave it late, but this could be a turning of the tide for Lazio this season. Yeah, speaking of leaving it late, I'm just going to focus back on Inter Milan, which is uh, my pick. And I know most of us picks for winning Scudetto. And I was a little worried about what I saw in the opening weekend. They needed a Denzel Dumfries stoppage time goal to be Lecce. Uh, so I I'm intrigued to see how they do this time around uh, when they play Spezia at home. I'm imagining being at home, of course, at the San Siro might be you know, something good, but Lukaku did get opening scoring, so we have to see how they do. But Inter, they didn't get off, just like Juventus did, didn't get off to a start that I thought. But there you have it, that's uh, Serie A. Let's quickly move to La Liga. La Liga looked interesting, fun in the opening weekend, not for yours truly. Like, it was raining and didn't even get to see a goal at Spotify camp, no. Unbelievable. Uh, but we got some interesting fixtures here. James Bench, let's begin with you. What do you think? Uh, what do you like here from match day two? I mean, it's got to be the, the the most boring team in La Liga. Sociedad against dreary old Barcelona. Um, Barcelona. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if Jules Koundé will be available and uh, stick mm. him up front for the final yeah. 10 minutes if they're chasing <laughs> yeah. a goal. But this should be a real test. I mean, like, you know, Sociedad's a team where the identity, the, the players haven't changed a huge amount. And Barcelona, everything has changed. Um, that's a really fun test for, for me. And it's also, interestingly, one that's going to be available on, on UK TV, on ITV, oh, which go. is um, quite a significant move as La Liga sort of tries to build back its identity and, and win some some neutral viewers around. Um, I'm going to do a little score prediction for you as well. I think Barcelona are going to win this 4-3, just to really want to. <laughs> that would be so annoying. <laughs> Oh man! Well, the game I'm the game I'm picking is Celta Vigo Real Madrid. This game does not fail to deliver in terms of drama. One of the more overlooked games in La Liga because typically this game has title implications for Real Madrid. Every year that they've won a title in the last let's say five years, they've had to go to Vigo and get a heroic performance, a game where they typically don't play their best soccer, but their difference makers show up. Whether it's Cristiano Ronaldo in the years past, Kareem the Dream. Showing up last season, 3-2 seems to be the golden scoreline against Vigo. Iago Aspas loves to play against Madrid. God, I don't I love see <laughs> that changing whatsoever. Interesting caveat for Real Madrid, though. I think, like, who do you who do you start in this game? Luka Modric on the bench. Casemiro on the bench. Casemiro, please, is my one United hit. Please, Casemiro. <laughs> if you like Nando's, if you like Rain, please come in, Manchester. <laughs> We need you. All right, got that out of the way. But oh that's going to be my game of the week. I, I think I see Madrid winning it. I see them winning, well, shocker, 3-2. I'm not sure if uh, if Casemiro does know what Nando's is, but I'm sure he'd like it. <laughs> whether, whether, whether he likes rain, I think, is an entirely different debate. Uh, I'm really tempted to go for Atleti Villarreal, but I'm actually going to go for a shameless plug instead. I wrote a piece on Real Betis oh. earlier today. <laughs> I was really impressed with the way that they started the season, winning 3-0 at home to Elche. That doesn't sound that special, but it was actually a 1-0 defeat at home against Elche that sort of basically put the nail in the coffin for their Champions League hopes last season. It's a fantastic documentary out on Copa 90 at the moment about how special Betis is a club. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there's just this feel-good factor around Betis at the moment. And if they can make the most of their winnable early season fixtures. Now, Mallorca's not the easiest away day, but it's also not the most difficult. And I think if Pellegrini has his task made a little bit easier for, for him with some players returning, then, you know, I think Betis... If they can make a fast start to this season, I can really see them making a good fist of trying to qualify for the Champions League. Let's not forget, they were only five points off of it last season, and it was their bitter rival, Sevilla, who finished just ahead of them. And now, Sevilla, uh, I mentioned it in the pod earlier this week, that I think they look a lot weaker uh, than they have done in previous seasons. So I think the time is right for Betis to try and strike and you know basically make that jump into the top four, perhaps at Sevilla's expense. But the other thing that kind of hit me, and I hate to bring up Forrest, Forest again is the fact that you've got Betis players rejecting a move to Forest, yet Forest outspending 
you know, Champions League hopefuls uh, like Betis. And Betis can't even register their signings so far, given the contract extensions they've given players, the unexpected uh, Joaquin staying on for a year. You know, I, th- I think it just illustrates really well sort of some of the challenges that, that La Liga are up against uh, right now and also kind of makes even more of a mockery of the Barca situation as well. So for me, I'm going to go 2-1 Betis winning that. I love it. I love it. Maybe Pellegrini gets in there with that fine first touch that he has. Um, we, I mean, we have to quickly touch on Atleti Villarreal. Both won 3-0 in the opening weekends. Um, I have high hopes for Joao Felix this season. I've been saying that for three years. I think that this is finally the one where he gets off. But also, the kid that plays for Villarreal, Nicholas Jackson, the Senegalese guy that mm. started in youth career. He looks very tasty. 21 years old. Watch out for him. This should be hopefully a goal scoring fest and hopefully it'll be a draw for the neutral i see it as a 2-0 but wouldn't be surprised if atleti win all right let's wrap everything up everybody with uh, uh the jonathan johnson hour here i want us to just give us the the, the lowdown here on uh, psg obviously we talked about them uh, recently neymar doing great so far uh messi of course feeling a little bit fresher Kylian mbappe you know there might be a rift there but still under Galtier, PSG look good, although it, it's going to be hard for PSG not to look good. However, they're playing Lille, Galtier's former side. What do you see in this game? What can we look out for? Because this should be pretty much the, the first tasty match of, of, of the French League in 2022-2023. Yeah, indeed. I mean, it seems weird to be talking about a clash between the top two in Ligue 1 after just two rounds of matches, but uh, that's that's where we are. Uh, good to see that Lost are looking a bit stronger than they did last season. It was a very underwhelming attempt at a title defence. Uh, you know, they've changed things around. And now with Paolo Fonseca on the bench, you know, I think that he is going to be a worthy adversary for, for Galtier. And this is a really good test to see sort of how far PSG really have come because, yeah, we've seen them thump Clermont, we've seen them thump Montpellier. With all due respect to those two teams, I expect them to be dwelling in the bottom half of the table this season. So Lille, with some of the additions that they've made so far in this transfer window, I think they've made another fantastic one in picking up Alan Virginia, a very talented youngster from Sochaux during the week. Uh, I think that this one could be the first time that we see PSG really tested. The the whole thing with the, the potential tension between Mbappe, Neymar and Messi, I mean, I think really it's as simple as this. Mbappe was suspended for the Trophy de Champion at the beginning of the season. Then he picked up an injury and he's seen Neymar and Messi go on early season tears in terms of their goal scoring form. I, I think once he starts getting back amongst the goals, uh, you know, he'll chill out a little bit. But, but we did already say it on the podcast, he has to be taken off penalty taking duty. <laughs> but is, is he going to sort of face any punishment for, I mean, kind of, I, I mean, more so than the penalties. I thought that, you know, you see that happen a lot, but I have not seen a player just stop attacking like Mbappe mm. did in that last game and just throw a hissy fit. But do we know, was it definitely pitch. a hissy fit? Or was it well, just because he turned around and walked away? Yeah, I know. It was weird. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, I guess. It's like, what? I mean, what's going on, JJ? The latest. Well, the, 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 the official line out of the club and also out of Mbappe's mother is that uh, anything that goes on within the team gets handled internally. And I think that's a big difference already for PSG. You Mm. see when you've got guys like Luis Campos in particular, who also, you know, is coming up against his former club, because let's not forget, he was the architect of that Lille title winning squad from a couple of years ago. They've handled it internally. Uh, You know, it'll be interesting to see if there is a difference in his behavior now, but I think it's already been made clear to him. You know, it's unacceptable. But that Uh, answers James Benger's point, I think, because there is a problem then. Yeah, Will director of football Kylian Mbappe have signed <laughs> star forward Kylian Mbappe D- two weeks ago. The DOF, the DOF. Yeah, yeah, it's the football version of uh, customer service saying, "Please hold on, I'm getting the." I mean, I also, also, I mean, also, I mean, look, look at it from Mbappe's point of view. Would you not be like a little bit pissed off that Neymar and Messi have just suddenly started playing after like a year of yeah. doing nothing? Oh, for and you're sure. Putting the team on, you no, putting the team. He on has a back? point. He has a point. But to Benji's point, it's very weird in a game to just be like, "All right, uh, screw it." Like they're not passing it to me, boo hoo. Yeah, I, I don't. I, then, I don't think yeah, as well. It's not. Doesn't sound great for PSG if the response to two players well, like stopping it, yeah. phoning it in is Mbappe's <laughs> like, well, I'm going to phone it in now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, everybody I, I, has I, a point. Well, what's your prediction for this game, JJ? 
Uh, I'm going to go narrow PSG win. I think they'll be made to work for yeah. it. I'll say 2-1, which seems to be uh, you know coming up quite a lot in terms of the score predictions uh, this weekend. But I, I definitely think this will be the toughest test for PSG so far. Uh, and I think that we'll see a more concerted effort from Mbappe, Neymar and Messi to be playing together and coexisting uh, nice and peacefully. Let's not forget, it's never a dull minute at PSG. There is always <laughs> some drama. So expect uh, something to kick off that we can sink our teeth into next week absolutely mike chime in uh yeah. on this game and give me a prediction no Kylian mbappe no stranger to controversy in the last six months also had a little bit of a bust up uh in the media with rabio and his mom which is never when i say that out loud that <laughs> you, might, you must be dev- you must be devastated <laughs> that they're not rocking up at old trafford oh my gosh i would i would i would I give am, i would give a dreadlock to have them <laughs> rocking it up and bring this drama killian casemiro <laughs> not rabio we don't need you but uh well, rabio doesn't you. want you that's what yeah and, well he's, he's yeah because he's asking for half the stadium <laughs> in his wage demands yeah, but uh, jj question for you a, a team outside of this game that has caught my eye they caught my eye last year monaco disappointing result in the champions league qualifier losing out to psv i think 4-3 on aggregate and you know they got four points out of their first two games but slow start for them what do you make of their team this season do you think they could be out and out contenders or where do you see them competing in liga yeah, I mean, it, it, it's good to to chat about them because they are a team who I think really should be sort of, you know, the best of the rest in the gun, sort of targeting that second spot behind PSG. You're right, the, the result against PSV was really, really disappointing. I think the performance generally over the tie wasn't quite good enough. And Monaco, with all due respect to PSV and what they're doing uh, under Ruud van Nistelrooy, you know, Monaco really should still be in the Champions League for me. I think they have a squad good enough, uh, you know, to get into the group stages. But also on the other side of the coin, perhaps, you know, Monaco going straight into the Europa League, uh, they can better uh, their showing last season, which was also quite underwhelming and make a deep run because a deep run that potentially sees them win the Europa League is perhaps more valuable than them being in the group stage and maybe getting dumped out and then dropping into the Europa League. That's me trying to you know look at it in a positive way. I think Monaco missing out on uh, Sumare from Leicester at this moment in time. Uh, could be a bit of a blow because they do really need to replace uh, Chiuamani in midfield, especially with Fofana now suspended. Uh, But they're coming up against a very tough Lens side, one of my favourite teams in Ligue 1 uh, to watch. I'm a massive fan of Franquez. And I think, uh, you know, this is going to be a tough test for Monaco. They can't really afford to to drop more points. But also at the same time, uh, you know, Lens, uh, if they want to get themselves in and amongst the European chasing pack, are going to need to pull off something of an upset. So Monaco, I definitely think should be targeting that second spot behind PSG and they have the manpower to do it but I do think that Paul Mitchell needs to get active in the last couple of weeks of the the transfer window especially if the Sumare deal doesn't get resurrected because it sounds like Leicester are asking more than Monaco are willing to pay at this moment in time. All right, fantastic stuff. What a great weekend preview. And we didn't even go deep on Arsenal to uh, James Benj's sadness. But let's do final thoughts, everybody. And don't forget, by the way, to follow us on Twitter, Kegolasso Pod, youtube.com forward slash Kegolasso. Again, thank you so much for 20,000 subscribers. Let's keep climbing. James Benj, final thoughts, my friend. Yeah, the big thing I'm interested in, it's not even going to be happening on the football pitch. I'm going to try and keep this brief, but the talking point of the Premier League right now, it's not quite, is the price of the pint at the London Stadium. (laughs) £7.20. What? (laughs) £7.20 on um, Thursday night for the Europa Conference League game. And this is interesting Mm. because West Ham don't own their stadium, the London Stadium, 2012 Olympics. It's owned by... um, London Legacy Corporation. I don't want to get too much into the, the nitty gritty, but it means oh, but that... you, oh, but you do. Oh, I do. I do. <laughs> do a whole podcast on this. Um, but to briefly keep on point, it effectively means West Ham don't have the right to set the price for their own pints. However, the agreement they have with the owners of the stadium means that the price should be set in line with other stadia. Most of the time in London, even in a football stadium, you can get a pint for about six quid, which is massively overpriced, but as is um this is really interesting stuff i mean it's, it's a lot it's a lot it's of a money. huge I amount mean, of money for a, a i club. left england when it was like 320 this is just yeah, you wouldn't even get that in the north now. no chance <laughs> you know you know what guy guys i have the smallest violin in the world right here because a pint in paris a pint <laughs> in paris costs like upwards of 10 euros 
Ouch. That's what? ridiculous. That's, that's well, without even I'm going so anywhere glad. near a football stadium. Well, this is the beautiful thing about being in Spain because water is more expensive than beer right here. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's fine. Yeah. But 720 is a lot, James Mance. That's a lot. How much is it at the Emirates? I don't know, man. I get all my food for free there. <laughs> oh, okay. Jeez. Press box privileges. <laughs> now we're moving on. Now we're moving. Mike LaHood, final thoughts. Ah, uh, this is the point, and it was still early on, but this is the point in the European seasons that I'm looking to see which summer arrival can just get going. With Liverpool, we saw Darren Nunez get off, it was open his scoring account, and also do the WWE and headbutt someone. <laughs> Erling Holland had the open his account, but I'm, I'm looking throughout Europe to see which summer signings can start making a splash. Do we see Lewandowski get the, the weight of the world off his shoulders? Do we see a, a standout display from Chamonix from Real Madrid? But that's what I'm keeping an eye on this week. And to your point, LME, I now see why alcohol is cheaper than water. It's probably what the Barcelona accounting team was <laughs> drinking when they filled Ooh, out the books. So the shade leave it at that. on Barcelona. The shade. The shade. Jonathan yeah, Johnson, yeah. final thoughts, buddy. <laughs> Well, you know what? Uh, on on that uh, topic of uh, expensive drinking out in Paris, Mike Lahoud, I recommend you take out a bank loan uh, before you come <laughs> over for your trip in a couple of months' time. Get refinance the house or whatever you need to do. Yeah. I'm I'm used to that feeling after my recent holiday to uh, to Sardinia. No, last last shout out. We didn't give it too much love on the on the show today. Uh, there's a couple of really exciting Bundesliga uh, matches mm. coming up. Uh, Borussia Dortmund at home to Werder Bremen. Uh, You've got uh, Wolfsburg against Schalke, you know, Werder yeah. and Schalke uh, having come back, bounced back immediately from the Bundesliga's vice. So uh, definitely going to be keeping half an eye on what's going on in uh, Germany this week, as well as uh, my favorite team in, uh, in the Bundesliga, which is uh, FC Köln. Absolutely. Well done, Jonathan Johnson. So we don't get the Bundesliga faithful yelling at us because we didn't preview <laughs> anything. But uh, my only final thought is good luck, uh, Mike Lahoud. Austin FC against Gareth Bale's LAFC this weekend uh, should be a fun game oh, i believe if i'm looking at the standings it's first against second right oh that that's next weekend this is minnesota oh, that's United, next weekend which is second, what do you have this weekend second against fifth so oh, still damn. big game it's it's the it's the tee up Ooh. before the big big one and, Ever uh, Everton's, uh, Everton's conquerors minnesota <laughs> united <laughs> you know what last time i spoke on that i got absolutely just bushwhacked by you two so i'm just gonna i'm gonna stay mum over it you know meds are working today well i'll tell you something austin fc let's hope uh you have a really good season and then get into yeah. the playoffs and then ian paul joy has his ring let's get you a ring for uh, mls that that would be uh, fun baby i love it right love hand it. needs love... it left hand yeah. got one right hand needs it because you know it's definitely not coming from uh, old trafford anyway let's uh move on <laughs> thank you everybody so much for being part of the family kegel support on twitter at james bench at john underscore like gossip at mike lahoud Follow all our content on CBS Sports. We will be back for Sunday recap. We've got Fabrizio Romano next week. And I believe Mike and James will be here for the Liverpool Manchester United recap as well. Should be a fun one. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lisa Roman, standing in for the very lazy Des Norris, who's never coming back because he's just <laughs> taking too long on vacation. I'm kidding, Des. You deserve every single minute. Thank you, everybody. Have a fantastic weekend. See you next time. Till then. Bye-bye.